not only wearing blue, but also pink. Have you seen it before? Have you noticed that before? Okay, let's have some pictures. Uh, here, in, over the course of time, I looked at, I used the Google to find some great uh, pieces of art. The first one I want to show you is from uh, Pierre D. Custom. And see here, she has the blue one on the outside, almost a little black with our projection here. But notice what color her dress is there. A reddish, light reddish pinkish there. I'm, I'm calling that pink. <laughs> okay, let's have the next one here. Uh, Father Filippo Lippi. And here, Mary's wearing the blue. And there, what, on, her, on her blouse there. Almost that reddish, pinkish. I'm calling that pink. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> now, that first picture that we showed was the Annunciation, where the angel Gabriel came to Mary and said, Hey, good news, you're going to have a baby. I know you're not married, but hey, good news, you're going to have a baby. <laughs> and then here's the, here's the no room for the in the end, except for the stable, and, and there's the birth of Jesus. And let's have this next picture. This is uh, uh, done by Tizan. And this is the Assumption of Mary, or also known as Mary, Queen of Heaven. And notice she's got that blue, but also that color I'm calling pink. In the full dress. And so Mary is often depicted in this color. If it's not quite red, it's pinkish, if you will. And so it's appropriate that we're trying to sort of capture the joy of Mary, the joy of, of bringing the Savior into the world that we use this candle, that we call the Mary candle, we use this color, pink, to represent it, as we prepare for Christmas. And so as we light this third candle, in this third week of preparing for Christmas, we remember the joy, not only of Mary, but of the church, as it prepares, not only for resurrection, but as it prepares for the first coming of Jesus into the world. So we light this candle of pink to represent that kind of joy. And as we encounter the scriptures, but back to Mary, as we encounter the scripture that we have today, we encounter a girl who is 15 years old, who is pregnant, who is not married, but who is overjoyed. And she says this, let's have the next moment of life. My soul magnifies the Lord. And my spirit rejoices in God my Savior. Now, every time I read this text, I find great comfort. Every time I read Mary's song, I find great comfort in a time when it couldn't possibly be... I mean, if you just look at the facts, it couldn't possibly be a very exciting time for her. Here she is, poor. No money. I mean, she always already says that in the way that she describes her song. I am the lowliest of the low, you know. But yet the Lord is going to lift me. And not, but it seems like, how's he going to lift her up? He's going to get her pregnant. <laughs> As I heard the rumor today, I was like, how is that big news? <laughs> really? It is good news, though, but it's, it's not, a, as my wife is apt to remind me, you know, uh, pregnancy is not all a bundle of joy. <laughs> it's, it's not all licorice and gumdrops, you know. There are some tough moments. And yet it is filled with joy. Even the same. It's like that mixed bag that Carol reminds us of. of, of, of it's a joy to be sending new missionaries into the field. <laughs> wish they were somebody else's grandkids. So. It's a mixed bag, this joy that we receive in Christ Jesus. But it is a joy that goes beyond our understanding. It goes beyond our measurement of the facts. And so when I read even now this story, the song of Mary, I find comfort. And now, oftentimes I'll open up the song of Mary in the midst of my crisis, you know, when, on those times when I am feeling, I'm not feeling the joy of salvation and Lord. I will open up Mary's song, and I will be akin to this one who is 15, unmarried, and pregnant. <laughs> all in all, things are not going too well for her, but yet she is able to achieve the joy of <coughs> trading the sorrows for the joy of the Lord. Wow. 
She's my hero. And so as I read this scripture again this week, I, I think of another moment, uh, and a, a movie comes to mind. Have you ever seen the movie Spinal Tap? Okay. I'm not sure. I really said no one's going to know that movie, so you're going to have to explain it. Uh, it is a, it's sort of a satire. It's, about, uh, it's a, done as a documentary about this fake uh, rock band. And uh, Rob Reiner, has anybody heard of Rob Reiner? Yes. Okay, he, you'll see Meathead, okay, uh, in, in this documentary. He is the one who is the, uh, he's the, actually the director of the show, Spinal Tap, but he inserts himself in this documentary, and he's visiting with the lead guitarist of this fake rock band <coughs> as the lead guitarist explains ampli amplifiers and their special amplifiers. So, uh, watch this clip for me. You know, we use on stage, but it's very, very special because you can see yeah. the numbers all go to 11. Look, right across the board. Um, 11, oh, 11, and mostly 11. And now it's go up to 10. Exactly. Does that mean it's louder? Is that any louder? Well, it's one louder, isn't it? <coughs> it's not 10. You see, most most blokes are going to be playing 10. You're on 10 here, all the way up, all the way up, yeah. all the way up. You're on 10 on your guitar. Where can you go from there? Well, I don't know. Nowhere. Exactly. What we do is if we need that extra push over the cliff, you know what we do? Put it up to one. Exactly. One exactly. Why don't you just make ten louder and make ten <coughs> the top number and make that a little louder? <laughs> Why don't you just make ten louder, right? <laughs> <laughs> now he has these go to eleven. What are you talking about? My soul magnifies the Lord. My soul amplifies the Lord. My spirit rejoices in God, my Savior. These go to eleven. If you look at the facts of Mary, she can't possibly be joy-filled. If you look at the facts. But yet, something beyond those facts steps in. And pushes it over the edge. These go to 11. Now, let's have uh, the next fill in the blank. <coughs> this is from John Wesley, a sermon that he did, or uh, a tract he wrote on the Christian life. And he writes this. A Methodist is one who loves the Lord his God with all his heart, all soul, with all his mind, and with all his strength. God is the joy of his heart, and the desire of his soul, which is continually crying, Whom shall I have in heaven but thee? And there is none upon the earth whom I desire besides thee, my God and my all. Thou art the strength of my heart, and thy portion forever. Therefore, he is happy in God, yea, always happy, is having him as a well of water springing up to everlasting life and overflowing in his soul with peace and joy. A Methodist is therefore happy in God, yes, yea, always happy, having him as a water springing up into everlasting life and overflowing in joy, his soul with peace and joy. These are not the first words of John Wesley that have scratched my head. Everybody, everybody here is Methodist, lifelong Methodist. You've experienced this, right? You're always happy in God. Not just sometimes happy in God, but always happy in God. Perpetually happy in God. You always have that ultra bright smile on your face, right? Yeah. Huh? And certainly Wesley wasn't thinking of ultra bright Christianity here either. Because he was one who suffered from depression. If you look at his books, I mean, they didn't have the fancy medicine for that. But at, the, at his time, but he suffered from depression. You could see how he was such a sort of roller coaster up and down through all of his life. And so, what is he getting at here? Always happy? Really? If we look at the facts, John, if we look at the facts of your life, it doesn't look like you've been always happy. It doesn't look like. Your soul magnifies the Lord, and your spirit rejoices in God my Savior all the time. But yet, that's what you're telling us is the, is the mark of the Christian life. Well, 
Well, perhaps it's more like a spinal tap than we realize. Perhaps the point that, you know, if you're happy in God, well, why don't you just make the amplifier go up to 10? Why don't you just make 11 the number 10? And I think the problem with that is, is that if we say, once we come through the waters of baptism, that everything is just hunky-dory on our own, on the face of the whole, if you just add up all the facts, that everything just looks like, oh yeah, everything's rosy for this person. Everything's happy. Everything's joyous for this person. But that is not... The that is not what happens as we come through the waters of baptism. That is not what happens as we come through even the profession of faith and the joining of the Methodist circle. We can't say that by human measure that the number 10 is really number 11. Now. But praise be to God. We can say that God inserts himself beyond the fact Beyond the numbers that we measure. So that it can give us that little push over the edge. It can give us that little push over the edge so that we can get to 11. These go to 11. These go to 11. We celebrate this joy with pink. And I've seen pink other places in the season. Recently, I've been seeing pink in these garbage cans. <laughs> And it's caused me to do some investigation about that. Why do we have pink garbage cans? And it's the Susan J. Coleman Foundation. Susan J. Coleman, if you take a look, I looked her up too. So, okay, what's going on with her? Well, she had breast cancer, as it turns out. Well, you think, oh, okay, well, Susan J. Coleman, she had breast cancer. And she, uh, her name, it's named, uh, the Race for the Cure is named after her. And in that race for the cure, they, uh, all the survivors who were in that first race in New York City, all the survivors of breast cancer were given a pink ribbon. <coughs> well, that's joyful. I get that. It's, you know, they survived. Hooray, they survived. That's good news. Because there can't be good news when you hear, oh, uh, there's a lump. <coughs> good news, they survived. So Susan J., she must have some, Susan, I'm getting that wrong, Susan G., uh, she must have some good news, right? Oh, not so good news for Susan. She came down. She was diagnosed with the cancer, and then she died a year later. And her sister, in memory of her, of Susan, started the foundation. And started the foundation with the joy of life everlasting in Christ Jesus. With the joy of, if we just make people more aware, then maybe we can detect it earlier. With the joy of saying, you know, it's not an easy thing, and the facts aren't good, but we need to encourage one another by wearing the pink. And just that simple gesture of having a pink trash can can make all the difference. <coughs> Mary sings the song of overjoy, of this song of 11. These go to 11. This amplification song, these go to 11. She sings a song as she's pregnant, unmarried, but she sings a song as she goes to visit another pregnant lady. Who was that? Elizabeth. Elizabeth who was up there in years. Like me. <laughs> Even more. And you can't, and it was the first child that they were having. You can't think that was going so great for Elizabeth. And so she needed a bit of encouragement. And God sent Mary. <clears throat> and as soon as they saw one another, the, the child in her womb leapt for joy, says Elizabeth. And she knew that Mary was pregnant with the Savior. And beyond the facts, these go to love. Beyond the facts, joy. God inserted God's self so that we might have joy. <coughs> Your so, pink. So pink is the color of joy, but it's also the color of joy that encourages. 